Welcome to Ivy Church. Welcome to Ivy Church. Welcome to church. Welcome to church. Good to see you. Welcome to Ivy Church. Hello and welcome to Ivy Church. It is so lovely to be with you this morning and to welcome you to online church today. My name's Louise and I'm one of the leaders here at Ivy. And if you're a regular to Ivy, then welcome back. But if you're new and this is your first time checking us out, then a huge warm welcome to you. Thank you for tuning in. Do stay with us as we have a great service for you this morning and you won't want to miss it. But if you are new, then let me encourage you to check us out at ivychurch.org. Everything that you need to know is on there about us. It tells you who we are, what our vision is, where we meet, as well as loads of the other stuff that we have going on during the week. So do check it out. Today, we're starting a new series, which we are really excited about, called Revival Fire. And as we approach Pentecost, we are fully believing and praying for revival as a church. Anthony's starting the series this morning and it's called Fired Up. Today is Ascension Day where Jesus ascended to heaven so that the Holy Spirit, our helper, would come and live in us. And so as Jesus says, we would therefore do greater works than he did because of the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. Anthony's going to unpack that some more this morning and you'll need to turn to your Bibles to Acts 1 verses 1 to 10. It is going to be great. Also, as part of our time together this morning, we're going to be taking communion together. So during worship, you might want to gather the things that you need for that. And later in the service, I'll guide us through together as we celebrate Jesus's life. But let me pray for us before we worship together. God, we pray that we would see revival come here on earth. We pray that we would see a miraculous move of your spirit over this place. We pray for those who are far from you to come back to you. We pray for our families. We pray for our places of work. We pray for our colleagues, our friends, that you would move powerfully and that we would see your kingdom advance on this earth. And we pray this in faith today. Amen. Let's worship together now. Shine. 
In a moment, we're going to take communion together. But before we do that, we're going to give you an opportunity to give back to God. And we want to say a huge thank you to those of you who give faithfully to Ivy. As when it comes to giving to this church, we get to both honour and join God in what he's doing here to extend his kingdom. When we give, it's not about making a sacrifice. It is part of our worship to him in giving him our everything and giving him our all. It's God working in and through us and teaching us about when we sow well and trust him with our offerings that we will see an incredible harvest. So if you would like to give, you can follow the link on the screen now and you can give at any time during the service or throughout the week. But we're going to take communion together now. We take communion to remember what Jesus did for us when he died on the cross for us, to forgive us of all of our sins and to give us freedom. But first, let's quieten our thoughts and pause to be still while we bring ourselves to him afresh today. As we open our hearts to God, we are sorry for the things that we have done, either in what we've thought or the words we've spoken or the actions we've made. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out from darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. Communion is an opportunity for us to look back at what Christ did for us on the cross by dying for us and then being raised to life on the third day. For us to look around at what we have and who we have that life with and to look forward to the day when we will share in one big communion celebration in heaven. I'm going to read the Last Supper from the book of Mark. And it says this. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink all of this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Lord, I come before you today with thanks. In taking communion, we are so thankful to you for your perfect love and sacrifice you made. Your desire to have a relationship with us was so great that you made a way for us to be with you. Thank you for your love for us, which surpasses all understanding. Thank you for enduring the pain and humiliation of the cross in our place and declaring us righteous before the Father. We don't deserve your grace, but you have extended it to us freely and we thank you. Amen. We're going to hear from Anthony now. Well, we are beginning a new series today called Revival Fire. How exciting is that? I'm going to start by reading some scriptures just to get us all thinking along the same lines together. Because this, according to the church calendar, this is the week when the ascension of Jesus is celebrated. We often think about Christmas and Easter. Before long, we're going to be celebrating Pentecost, which is perhaps less well known out in the wider world. But I hope many in church will have heard about, about it. It's, it's called the birthday of the church. But when was the last time you heard a talk about the ascension? What's the purpose of it? What's the benefit to us that Jesus ascended to heaven? How could that possibly have been good news? So my first scripture is from John 14. On the night that Jesus was, before he was betrayed, before he went in, in, into the upper room there with his disciples, uh, though he's been predicting and prophesying and preparing them for what's to come, he's still thinking about them and not himself and how they're going to be worried when they see him on a cross, of course, and then being taken down from there and then put in a tomb. And surely that would be the end. But he says this in John chapter 14, verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, 
would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. So he wants them to know God has got a plan, even when it looks like everything's totally out of control, all of it's leading somewhere. And in fact, he's leading them to something better if they will follow him. If you become his follower, this life is not the stop of your life. It is a step into a better one that lasts forever. That's why following him makes all the difference now and forever. Right away, Thomas voices his doubts about this. He's saying, we don't even know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus tells him, I'm the only way to God. I'm the only one who tells you the real truth about God. I'm the only one who can help you have real and everlasting life. I'm the only one who can help you know God as Father. And then another disciple, Philip, says, yeah, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus says, I've been right here with you all the time. Anybody who's seen me has seen the Father. I've come to show him to you, to connect you to him. So just trust me, just believe in me. He says it over and over. That's all we have to do. That faith, that believing makes all the difference. Reading on, look at, at verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing. They will do even greater things than these. Why? Because I am going to the Father. Jesus says the way is open and the possibilities really are endless for you and for me, for anybody who believes in him. Miracles can happen right now. His followers will be able to do the same things he did. Multiplying resources to meet every need, healing sicknesses and diseases, setting people free from demonic powers, even confounding the laws of nature because Jesus made the laws of nature. He created creation. He did all those things and he said what he wants what he wants more than anything is that we, you and me, will do even greater things, that nothing will be impossible, but it will be available. We'll be able to do them. We'll be able to do them, not just him, because we believe in him. And why can that happen? Not just because of the incarnation, which means, means Jesus came down from heaven to earth at Christmas. Not just because of his teaching, although nobody ever taught with such power and wisdom and authority. Not because of his death on a cross, which enables all of our sins to be forg forgiven. Not even because of his resurrection, which is our grounds for certainty that we ourselves will live with him forever. Even though we die in this mortal body, we will be raised up too. But notice, Jesus said, we'll be able to do greater things than him because of the ascension. Because he's gone to the Father. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather have Jesus right next to you or have the Holy Spirit within you? Which, which would be best? I think we might think, well, wow, to have been like those disciples, to be one of the 12 or, or one of the Marys and those women who travelled along with Jesus, how amazing would that be? Wherever he went, they went. Surely that would be the best. But Jesus said, no, that's not the best. It's not best that you be with me wherever I go. It's better that I will be with you wherever you go. A couple of chapters on, same place same conversation. The disciples are even more anxious now because he's been warning them that the times are going to get tough for them too. For his followers who love him, this world, he says, will hate you for that. You'll be persecuted, Jesus says, if you stand with me and, and for my truth. And then he says this, this is chapter 16, verse 5. But now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asked me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. I don't want to just skip over those words. Another translation puts it like this. It says, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Sometimes that word nevertheless is used there as a contrast to what the disciples must have been thinking and feeling. But he says it again to underline the importance of what's going on. I tell you the truth. This is really important. And what he says next must have been incredibly shocking. They had him right where they wanted him. And then they lost him. And now they've got him back from the grave. But he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. The word advantage means useful, profitable, beneficial. And the disciples are like, no way. 
It, how can it be a good thing for Jesus not to be with us? How could that possibly be? And then Jesus tells them and us, if I don't go, he can't come. The helper, the Holy Spirit won't come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. It's for your own good. It really is. It's best. He knows what's best. Three times in that passage, Jesus uses the word go to help the disciples understand. Yes, he was about to go. That's probably all they could hear. But he wanted them to hear why, that it would be better for them because when he goes, then the help of the Holy Spirit could come. His, his going is essential to the Holy Spirit's coming and having God in us is even better. It's even more precious than having God with us. At Christmas, the Father sent the Son. The Word made flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. On Good Friday, Jesus was the Lamb of God taking our sins away on the cross, God for us. But now, in his great love, he's going to go and send the Spirit to be God in us. So he says, it's for your good that I'm going away. Then you'll never be alone. This is how I'm never going to leave you, nor will I forsake you. I'll go, he'll come for your good. God will be with you. God will be in you. This isn't, Jesus isn't thinking about himself. He never is. Of course, he says it's going to be good in the sense that Jesus' trials and suffering in this sin-sick world that rejects him, blasphemes him, that tortured him over and over, will be over. But he says, I'm going to ascend. I'm going to go back to the Father I love. And when I go, I'll be glorified and celebrated and applauded and worshipped. He's the hero of heaven. But he's not thinking about his own good. He's thinking about ours. So he says, if I don't go, if I don't go there, the Holy Spirit can't come here. The comforter, the advocate, the helper, the one you most need, the power you need can only be present with you if I'm absent, absent from you. I was sent by the Father. Now I'm going to ascend to the Father. Then I will send him. He's the best. The Holy Spirit is the best. He's coming to be your best friend forever. Your BFF, the Holy Spirit. They couldn't understand it before it happened. But I hope we can now look back at what Jesus said and realise that it really is for our benefit that he would go so the Holy Spirit could come and live in us. The fire of God burning inside of us, setting us ablaze with his inextinguishable flame. As we start a new series, we're going to have a week of prayer and fasting ahead of us, ahead of Pentecost. Sunday the 19th will be Pentecost. We'll have the week through that, various other activities throughout the month because in our year of transformation, we want to act and live and pray like people God has set ablaze with holy fire. We're looking at the difference Pentecost is meant to make and for us to grasp that, we need today, this week, to focus on the ascension. Hugely significant moment that's unfortunately often overshadowed by other events that seem important, kind of get skipped over too often. It's vital to remember the ascension is not incidental. It's not just Jesus' exit strategy. It's his intentional method to release his miracle power and the promise of his presence to you and me, his followers. Christ's ascension has often been a neglected study, even though, as we just saw, Jesus talked about its importance and its purpose and declared that his ascension would be to our advantage. The cross and the resurrection were to make us new. So you and me could now become a new creation. The old has gone. But without the Lord's ascension, we could never be baptised in the Holy Spirit. Without being baptised into the Holy Spirit, we'd be like a lovely, shiny, brand new car with no engine, no power. Jesus stayed with the disciples, the Bible says, for nearly a month post-resurrection. Oh, how they must have loved those times. He physically appeared, resurrected to them, a dead man now more alive than ever. He would appear to small groups or to a couple walking along together, to his own brother James, who only now finally became a believer that his brother was also his saviour. At one point he appeared to 500 people altogether, but even then he's limited by his physicality. He can't be with everyone everywhere, not like that. He's teaching them week after week about how he fulfilled the prophecies and the promises of the Old Testament. He's telling them to get ready, what to expect for the future as best they can receive it. And in Acts chapter 1, it says, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. But he knows if the movement is to grow, if these people are not just going to keep on coming to him, but to be able to go for him, for his presence and his power to be with them, as they go into all nations and make disciples, he has to go so we can go. 
They're having another meal. He looks at them again. He has to get them ready. Ready for what's to come. Ready for who is to come. And in Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 we read, On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptised with water, but in a few days you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. Why? What difference is that going to make? Well, verse 8, he tells us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, the Holy Spirit, he's a fire lighter. He's not just given to comfort us. He's given to put a fire under us and in us to put God's revival flame into human hearts so we burn bright and carry that flame into this dark world. By the way, maybe some of you could really benefit from signing up and finding out about the School of Ministry and Mission that's going to be starting here in September with Jonathan Conrath and Mission 24. So you really experience the reality in your life of what that means to be those witnesses who see his power. Unless the Holy Spirit sets you alight, you'll have no power. I'll have no power to be a witness for Jesus. When did you last witness for him? Tell somebody about him. Don't rule yourself out. Don't let yourself off. Don't point to somebody else to do it. How about you? The fire of God could be missing, but the fire of God is not sent to give us some warm feelings for our enjoyment or emotional experiences in church. Although, of course, the Holy Spirit can and does touch our hearts in wonderful ways. Holy Spirit power isn't just for powerful church meetings and worship. Holy Spirit power is for powerful Christians to be set on fire and go into the world. Jesus expected all of his disciples to be fire lighters. What about you? Has the fire gone out? With everything that's gone on in the world, was it ever really lit? Is it still ablaze? Jesus instructed his disciples not to do anything until, unless they received power from on high. We don't just stay carrying on his instructions and trying to do it in our own power. We need the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit came, he revealed himself as tongues of fire sitting on every head that was gathered there. We're not just here to get excited, we're here to get ignited. He told his disciples, get ready, ready for Pentecost, ready for the power for heaven. And then he went to heaven and, and reading on in, in Acts chapter 1 verses 9 to 11, it says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. A cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. When Jesus was walking around, God with us on earth 2,000 years ago, God's miracle work was contained to wherever he was at that moment. But now that he's in us, the Holy Spirit's power is in us wherever we go. The Holy Spirit inside us is better than Jesus beside us. He said so. The disciples there, looking around, mouths wide open, wondering what was going on. But we know that though he departed physically from their sight, Jesus said, I'll never leave you as orphans. His ascension was the preparation that's necessary for us so the power can come, so greater things really can happen right here and now. Because he goes to the Father, we can go for him and he will come with us. The Holy Spirit will come with us. Jesus is praying right now in heaven that we will carry on and do his work on the earth. You're on Jesus' prayer list. Isn't that amazing? He's ascended and he's praying. He's been glorified and he's sent, he's given us everything we need on the earth to get the job done. His Holy Spirit. This promise is fulfilled. It's full of explosive potential for the church, for his church to be a supernatural community ignited by the revival fire of the Holy Spirit inside of you. How does your spiritual thermometer read today? Is it even registering? Jesus told a whole church full of people in Revelation 3, people who thought they'd be doing okay, that they seem to have everything, but he said, you know what, you're lukewarm. It's not a good thing according to Jesus. He said, I just want to spit that out. The dictionary says this about lukewarm, moderately warm or tepid, lacking conviction or half-hearted. The synonyms for that word are also revealing dull, apathetic, moderate. It's very telling, isn't it? He told them, 
Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. The word zealous there comes from a word that means hot at its root. If you go to Greece now and it's a hot day, you say polyzeste means very hot. The word there is zelu, and it's an onomatopoeic word. It means to imitate the sound of boiling water. Jesus says, be boiling. The word there means bubble up. The only way to live for Jesus is to bubble up and burn with zeal for him. The only way that happens, though, it's not me trying. It's when I'm continually filled with his spirit. How's the fire in your heart today? Is it enough to warm anybody else? Ask him today, Lord, you went to heaven. You sent the Holy Spirit. Is your warmth, is your worship without warmth? Is the Holy Spirit catching fire, something in you, melting away an icy heart? In the run-up to Pentecost, we're going to press even further into prayer and intercession for ourselves, for our church, for the world, for especially those who, who don't know the Lord yet. And we're going to be telling you various ways this will happen today. But let's not just look up to heaven and think about Jesus is coming back. Let's look inside and ask God to reignite that fire so it burns bright enough the whole world can see and know who we have inside of us, the power that fuels us. And remember, we're not called to be mere spectators of Jesus' ministry. We're meant to be participants in his mission, witnesses of his resurrection, and agents of his transformation, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do today greater things because he has gone to the Father. That was so good, wasn't it? I am so excited for this series. Let's be a church who collectively are choosing to pray and seek God for revival. And you know what? It starts with us, with each of us. So maybe when the service is over or maybe you want to pause it now, why don't you write down a daily prayer that you can say to God this week to invite the Holy Spirit again to live in you and to show you who to pray for and ask him to show you how to share him with others. Let faith arise In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you No matter what I feel, let faith arise Let faith arise for my champion's not dead, he is alive When oh, he already knows my every need Surely he will come and rescue me God of miracles come
Before we go, within this series, we're going to be having a week of prayer and fasting from the 13th to the 19th of May. At the start of each year, we as a church have done this and it's been so powerful. But this time, we're taking time to focus on seven key areas to pray and fast for, which we'll share in our newsletter and on our socials. So look out for that and partner with us in it. And on the 26th of May in the evening, we have a baptism service at Ivy Central. That's at 7 p.m. If you're interested in baptism and would like to chat more about it, then please email us at info at ivychurch.org. Finally, I would love to invite you to any of our services next week. We have in-person services at Didsbury and Cheadle Hume, as well as our online service here at 10.30. And you are super welcome to any of those that you choose. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. I have loved being with you all today. Have a blessed week and we'll see you all really soon. Take care.